My name is Al Rogel. Uh, it's difficult to think that I would commute between two institutions, but I do. I'm essentially emeritus. I'm past retirement age, so I'm retired from the University of Virginia, and I teach a week a month at Riley Hospital. I see patients at uh, both locations, and I do a few other things because uh, uh, I don't have a real job anymore. So this is what we're going to talk about. It says male adolescents. The only thing that it should be important is this is not little kids. Judy Ross is going to talk about little kids, and adolescents and adults are essentially the same for what we're uh, going to do uh, here. As I said, it will take me probably 40, 45 minutes to get through the slides. I'm absolutely happy to ask, answer questions. Do stop me in the middle, and if it's going to be a long answer, I'll say I'll refer that to the end or to the next hour. I do want to get through everything for uh, everybody. So, this uh, little lady, this is the introduction. Uh, what are we going to do today? I love art of children. This is uh, the turn of the 19th, uh, 18th of the 19th century uh, uh, from Poland, and she's asking the question, what are we going to do today? Well, let's think about it. We're going to talk about testosterone through the lifespan. The lifespan here will not include neonates and will not include uh, little kids because that's what Judy's going to talk about. The lifespan will be starting testosterone therapy at, at the time of puberty, marching through from uh, the low levels to the higher levels, and then what goes on in terms of uh, uh, ad, uh, adults. So the adolescents I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about uh, preparations, uh, and then the most important thing that is probably new to you is one of the whys. And one of the whys, we all talk about muscle, we talk about behavior, we talk about other things. That's probably the most <coughs> important one. Uh, men with uh, Feinfelter syndrome and other sex chromosome antiploides uh, have osteoporosis at a much higher rate than others. And for those of you who are adults, some of you are, I am not, I'm still a child, but uh, for those of you who are adults, osteoporosis you think is an adult disease, it is not. It's a disease that we as pediatricians need to worry about because we prevent it. Treating it is one thing, if you prevent it, you're much better off. So that's why I'm going to spend the last five minutes talking about peat bone mass. Not that you have to learn the science of it, but more importantly, this is the why, we, one of the whys for testosterone therapy. <coughs> okay, so very little science, but what happens is little boys uh, and girls have a relatively active hypothalamic pituitary, that's the machinery up here, gonadal, the ovary or the testis axis, at birth, and it goes to sleep for about 10 or 12 years. The longest uh, of any of our uh, mammals that we know of have this prepubertal pause, and then uh, at night it starts to wake up when we go into deep sleep and then during the day. The at night business is really important because it may be at uh, mid-puberty, a boy might have a level of testosterone that's a low man's level at 8 o'clock in the morning and a very low man's level at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So this is one of the few times that you really do need, when the doctor says, come at 8 o'clock in the morning, say, oh, come on, it means i got to get up at 5.30 and all that stuff, go at 8 o'clock, or at least get your lab sample done at 8 o'clock. It's really important because you can have a majorly misinterpretation of what the levels mean. That's really only like uh, on average boys from maybe uh, 12 to 16 or so. After that they become men and, and during the day uh, the testosterone levels and the uh, machinery that makes testosterone uh, go up uh, is awake all day long. So the when we talk about starting pubertal development and measuring levels, warning <coughs> is really important. It's not a trivial issue. Are there any more cheers anywhere? There's one here. Uh, so, now, what about some general principles? I think the general principles are important. Administer only to those who are hypogonadal. Makes sense. We're talking about replacement therapy. We're not talking about what happens to uh, athletes and stuff like that, which is always in the news. I work with uh, the uh, International Olympic Committee and others about doping, so I'm happy to talk about that, but not today. And uh, satisfactory replacement with a hypogonadism is primary, meaning a testicular disease. That's what we're talking about with sex chromosomes <coughs> and employees are secondary if the pituitary isn't working so well. It makes no difference. And the principal goal is to restore, notice the word, the serum sex hormone levels to the normal range. 
And when we talk about different preparations, we will find sometimes that's easy because the levels are steady all day long with certain preparations. And then with some of the longer acting preparations, they go up early, that is in the first few days after the injection, and then drop. So there are uh, some <coughs> difficulties. I won't go into the uh, science of how you uh, worry about those difficulties, but just to point them out. And many of you who take them can understand when I say two or three days after taking a shot, you get a little bit of a buzz. and two or three days before the next shot, you feel Ugh. So there are ways of getting around that, either with the same preparation given more often, or with some of the other preparations. That is what I am going to go through today, chapter and verse. So the ideal agent, safe, come on. Got to be safe, can't have it. Affordable, that would be nice. <laughs> Provider independent. Now that's something that for some of our kids is a bother because the kids need to get it every two weeks or every four weeks. And they need to go to a doctor's office. Most men, if they are injecting, will inject their own. They won't have to go to a doctor's office. And we can teach boys to do this or if uh, mom is a nurse or somebody in the family, they can get that done. But provider independent is uh, helpful. Now, pharmacokinetics is a fancy word to, to measure the levels as they go up and the levels as they uh, come down. Similar to physiology, okay? That's what, that's what the mother nature tells us. That's what physiology is. The normal, uh, uh, the uh, normal levels. So you would want what you are giving to mimic mother nature as much as possible because mother nature is a hell of a lot smarter than we are. At least I am. So, here we go. So, you want reproducible levels. You don't want to get something that one day you get levels of X and then, and then you get a new preparation and then three months later you get a new preparation, it's 3X and three months later it's a third X. You want something that's stable uh, levels and that is one of the things that is good about having FDA approved drugs because all of that stuff is tested as opposed to uh, non-FDA approved. Low abuse potential, that's probably not possible with uh, testosterone because there is an abuse potential no matter what. Okay, so the effects of testosterone in puberty are both anabolic, muscle building. So that's why uh, you see differences, especially in the upper body at puberty. Boys not only get taller, but they get wider, especially in their upper bodies. That's one of the major issues in uh, men with, uh, or boys and men, with sex uh, chromosome aneuploidies. They are especially, with small muscles, but especially in the upper body. It's hard to do push-ups and stuff like that. Androgenic are the male, uh, are the male features of them, the uh, genitalia, libido, those kinds of things. That's all the science we're going to go through. So, what do you want to promote with adolescence. So now we're going to start with adolescence. We will assume are in the pubertal <coughs> state at a time when they are supposed to be going through puberty. Okay? 13, 14, 15. So they promote secondary sexual characteristics. Okay? That's the, the muscle, the acne, those kinds of uh, uh, things. Linear growth, that's how you get your growth spurt. Normal muscle mass, we just talked about that. And I will come back to bone mineralization. That is something I want you to stick in your paleocortex. <laughs> so, this is uh, another slide about how kids grow. Not everybody follows the same pattern by time. This is by time, so this is how old you are. This is not how tall you are, but how much you are gaining year to year. So, it's, uh, as you're a boy, it's pretty much a flat line until you go into puberty early, so you have an intense growth spurt get up to maybe 10 or 12 centimeters a year, and then you quit. Or if you're delayed, and we will see this in many of the boys with sex chromosome aneuploidies, they continue to grow at a relatively slow prepubertal level, and then they slow down. We as pizendos don't see them, because on average they're tall, and we don't, uh, most people aren't so uh, attuned to the fact that they should be growing nine centimeters a year, and they're only four or four and a half, because they're tall. We as pizendos, uh, Judith Ross and me and Rodolfo was in the back of the room see these kids here and it may very well be normal uh, just delayed. They, if they are delayed in their growth they will have their growth spurt. It won't be so intense but they have more years to grow so they essentially meet 
uh, their genetic potential based on mommy and daddy. Now, if you have sex chromosome aneuploid, especially uh, uh, XXY or XXYY, XYY, you usually more than meet your uh, parental expectations. Uh, but again, this is these kids uh, don't show up in a pediatric endocrinology clinic at three or four because they're not because they're not growing. They are growing, and often they will start into puberty, so they don't see us for that reason, which is one of the major reasons that uh, at least uh, XXY, which is uh, the more common one, uh, those kids don't ever get to see uh, us or get diagnosed. All right, so we want to mimic puberty, early puberty. We find kids starting early puberty, are early in their own uh, natural puberty, or don't start at all, we would increase the levels over several years. Meaning that if you go to bed, uh, with, if you have 46XY, you go to bed a little boy, you don't have a <coughs> man with muscles and a voice like this overnight. So it takes two and a half or four years to do that. And so if we are replacing, we would escalate relatively slowly over that particular time. And, the, and if we use injectable, and I'll explain why we use injectable at the end, early on, uh, if we use injectable, we might start with 50 milligrams a month and wind up with 200 milligrams every two weeks. So we'll go from 50 to 400 uh, a month, somewhere in that range, escalating at six month levels, depending upon who the kid is in the doctor's uh, exam. Some kids will go through puberty from zero to 100% in a year and a half. Uncommon, we don't usually do that when we are inducing puberty ourselves. Late adolescence or mild deficiency, which is far and away the more common case with 46, uh, 47 XXY, they, most of the boys start puberty on their own. Often they're going through a relatively normal period, puberty, which is why they're not uh, diagnosed again. We can start with higher doses if they are uh, well through puberty, and we don't have to escalate quite, uh, uh, quite so much. Again, for these kids, after they're given their first few injections, talking to the parent and the child is more important than measuring levels. How does this particular individual respond to the unnatural application? Because no matter how good we are, it's still unnatural. Mother Nature is still, still better than we are. Okay, so what is available? Yeah, yeah, just a, we're blessed with amazing success here. It's brutally hot in this room. The next class for the, in this series, we'll move it to the theater where there's more room and better air conditioning. So at why, the end of it. Why are you being such a good guy? You got to talk about it. Jim, this, this is one guy. I have an image of you being a nice guy. You know? It's Robert's IQ. Okay. okay. <laughs> so the XXY track for this morning only will move to the theater and you deprive your kids of the movie. So, I'm still in 503 to one on one side. Okay, thank you so much, Jim. See, we are, we are a thoughtful bunch of people this morning. Okay, so I am going to go through these things because they're available. I will tell you why we don't use these. Okay, oral, that'd be the best thing of all. Uh, first of all, it doesn't work very well. And second of all, there are the side effects we don't care to have. Transdermal across the skin, scrotal patch. Just remember, the scrotal patches are very big, and the scrotums on these kids aren't. Enough said. All right. Non-scrotal patch would be that was supposed to be the best thing since sliced bread. And the non-scrotal patch, first of all, they're big. Second of all, they, they have to be occluded against the skin, and the chance of getting dermatitis is at least 50%, if not more. Uh, so, although theoretically these would be great. Uh, they haven't been. The gel packets and pump I will go over. That's a great way to give it uh, uh, in a mechanism that's relatively smooth day to day, month to month. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, and remind me if I don't uh, if I don't bring it up, uh, it has to be in this hour about the black box warning that the FDA has put on the gels. It has nothing to do with the meds has to do with transfer to women and kids, and that is an absolutely key element if you are a man and want to use the gel. No problem for you, but that is a problem whether uh, somebody comes into contact with you, somebody comes into contact with a washcloth or a towel. It is not trivial. Okay. 
So injectable, there are several injectables. I'll go through those. There is a new one coming on board, probably quarter four of this year, been used in Europe for years. It's called Nubido, not Nubido, but Nubido. And uh, it is a three month uh, uh, injectable. There are, uh, it's a big volume, et cetera, but it's only uh, uh, four times a year. And then there are some longer acting preparations. I will talk a bit about Testapel, very unpopular in this country, very popular in certain other countries, works perfectly well. This last one is another long-acting one, but is still in the uh, testing stage. And I think with Nibido out, these people will be quite secondary. So the oral antigens, testosterone unmodified, uh, just is not work, so you can't even think about using it. Seventeen alpha alkylate. These are the steroids that a lot of men uh, athletes have abused. Are the problems that you see? Hepatotoxic means liver. The transaminases are enzymes of the liver that say or are a marker for liver damage. Cholestasis. This is what happens when you get uh, stones in your gallbladder duct. Cholestasis is the, the uh, um, bile is just is static and uh, you get rocks in it. Peliosis hepatitis is a very serious condition. It's lakes of blood underneath the capsule of the liver and they can bleed with trauma, without trauma. <coughs> there is no reason, in my opinion, even to think of these drugs. Mm -hmm. So, the newest one is something to be thought about. The undecanoate, uh, for those of you who know uh, Latin chemistry, this is a, an 11-member uh, ester, meaning that it is uh, um, <coughs> absorbed differently than some of the other orals. So you can take it. It goes not through the liver in the first pass, but is absorbed directly uh, by the lymphatics. But there are problems with that. High inter-individual variability in absorption time to peak maximum concentration, and not always constant within an individual. Available in Canada, available in Europe, South America, Rudolfo? Okay, not available there. And you need to take multiple doses per day. Not everybody needs to say, take the same number of doses. We have no experience with it. Uh, if anybody's interested in it, you'll have to get it from Canada or probably the, would be the best place. I don't have experience. I don't recommend it because I don't know it. Um, oxandrolone is a drug that has been available to us uh, probably for 40 years. And we as pediatric endocrinologists used it in short kids before growth hormone came available and used it in girls with Turner syndrome. So it is anabolic, that is kind of makes you taller and more muscular and supposedly not androgenic. There's only one androgen receptor and it's hard to separate the two. The holy grail, of course, is to make something purely anabolic having no androgenic uh, activity at all. So some people uh, use this early on in puberty. The study that Judith Ross is going to talk about is specifically in children, not adolescents, in children with that particular drug. Non-aromatizable is a big bad word, but it essentially means it doesn't turn it into estrogen. Remember, all testosterone is, is a drug and a precursor for female hormone, one of the reasons why breast tenderness, breast development, gynecomastia can occur when you take testosterone itself. That doesn't happen with oxandrolone. And we use it, the most common reason we use it, this is constitutional delay of growth in puberty. It's kids who are small not going through puberty, and we don't know why. That's far and away the most common disease. It's not a disease, it's a... Uh, um, a variant of normal, that was that curve that dipped down before it went up, and, and girls with Turner syndrome. So, knowing that you can use this drug in girls with Turner syndrome tells you right away it's not potently androgenic, and what you're looking for here is not so much the anabolic actions, you're looking for the androgenic ones as well. So, it's a possibility, maybe early on in puberty, but certainly not mid to late puberty. So, the transdermal is the scrotal patch. Why? Uh, it's absorbed very quickly in the enzyme that you need to convert testosterone to its active product. The hydrotestosterone is there, just not possible with the adolescents. And most men don't want to use this uh, either. This came out 10 or 15 years ago. It was the first one available, so of course it got used. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to answer questions about it later. I don't want to spend time on I want to spend time on the ones that we actually do use. So the non scrotal patch, I mentioned you need enhancers to, to facilitate sufficient T passage through the skin, you're trying to get milligrams. It's a ton that you're trying to get through 
and whereas with the est estrogen patches for women at menopause is about a hundredth of the amount, so it's really easy to get a patch that's that big and you can get the estrogen and you certainly can't do it with testosterone. So skin irritation up to 60%, uh, the, uh, the enhancer and occlusive nature of the system. So it's occlusive and the enhancer leads to skin irritation. Some men still like to use these. It's a perfectly good thing to use. They're pretty big and you need to be sure that you uh, change the sites because you don't want to have the same variety, the same irritation all in the same place. Okay, so there's our uh, model. There's our model for it. And I hope you don't put it on that same arm every day. Okay, very good. <laughs> We're on the same page, sir. Uh, uh, now, let's talk about these. These are important. This is what you will hear about the most. This is what is being used. There are two companies. I am not speaking as a representative of anybody. I do work for some of these companies. Or Consulting, but this is a androgen. This is not a drug. Talk to a specific drug. So they come in gel. They uh, are about one percent absorbed. So twenty-five milligrams is the two point five grams, and fifty milligrams is the five gram dose. They are put on uh, once a day. The advantages are the last one: physiologic. Same word again. Levels of testosterone, that's good. Dihydrotestosterone is the androgen product that works. And if you use the injectable, DHT isn't in the normal range. And especially estradiol, that's also a product. That's the aromatization. That, those levels are normal for men during the day, whereas with the injectable, often they're above normal, as are the levels of testosterone. All of this that I show you is good. There are two major companies that make this stuff. There are companies like uh, with the um, uh, bioidentical with, with, uh, that you read about women that make this stuff. And you'll notice I don't see anything about bioidentical there. I don't believe in them at all. And the reason is not that they don't work. They can work. They can work perfectly well. It's the day-to-day, batch-to-batch variability. They're not regulated as a drug by the FDA. So they don't have to be, have the same tolerances. So I am pretty much, not pretty much, I, the Endocrine Society, which I belong to, are pretty much against compounding pharmacies uh, to do that. There is nothing unnatural about these products that we're uh, talking about. And so the advantages are ability to deliver testosterone, low, mid, or high physiologic range, comma, for men. These doses are way too high for starting kids. And the way I use the gel is I start with injectable, which we will come to shortly, and then when they're about mid-pubertal levels, then I give them the choice of going over to the gel or not. I have a few kids that have gone over to the gel, and about 50% stay on the gel, and about 50% go back to injections. It's just, it, for the kids, as opposed to men, it's just a bother every day to be sure you do everything right with the injectable, and especially with the newer injectables, not the one once a month, but the once every three months, I'll bet that uh, not so many of the younger kids will use the gel. For some, the gel is absolutely the best thing since sliced bread. So, lower incidence of skin irritation, actually it's in the 5% range, it really isn't. Uh, ease of application, absolutely. In invisibility of dry gel, but ease of application, but be careful about transfer to others and to inanimate objects like washcloths and towels and stuff like that. Uh, and there, uh, did transfer to women, not theoretical. There are some case reports of women who have had hirsutism uh, postmenopausally, and children who, uh, boys and girls, there are at least seven or eight individual cases of undoubted transfer. There are several law law suits in this country based on transfer, and that is where the black box warning has come from. The black box warning, for those of you who use this, has nothing to do with the safety or the efficacy of the drug to you or to your child. It does to others. So it's very odd variety. Black box warning usually means uh, it's a great drug, but you know, 5% of the people, 2% of the people get severe liver toxicity or something. 
That's not why the black box warning for this one is. So if you're assiduous about taking care of your hygiene, I'll, I'll put it that way, your hygiene about this drug, it's perfectly safe. It doesn't make any difference which of the two companies uh, is used. Okay, injectable. The propionate uh, has been available for 30, 40 years. You need to give it every two or three days and nobody's taken it. End of the patient. The enanthate or the sympionate are essentially the same. The one is Delatestrel, um, and there are many companies that make it. So the adult dose is 200 to 250 milligrams every two weeks, leads to virtually physiologic levels of T with peaks above the upper limit of normal within a few days of giving it, which is where some of the men say yeah, they get a buzz, and nadirs low, uh, below the uh, lower limit of uh, normal. If you give it once a month, as we usually start with kids, the low doses that we give usually have quite a spread between the upper and the lower, but they're, they're really not noticed. Many of the men who get a buzz at um, two or three days after, in the feel low heat two or three days before, we will often recommend instead of taking 200 or 250 every two weeks, to go ahead and take 100 every week. And so it's an extra set of extra injections. Most men, as I said, who are used to this will give their own injections sitting down with big muscle mass in their uh, thighs. The sipionate, I believe, is indistinguishable. There's just a minor difference, perhaps 10%, not clinically uh, significant. Uh, this is the new one. This is the new kid on the block, and you say, well, gee, everybody's going to go ahead and talk about the new one because it's the best thing in around. It's been used in Europe for at least five years. This is a good drug. So it is called Nabito. It is, I think, it's going to be the Endo, E-N-D-O uh, company. Should be available in uh, approximately the fourth quarter <coughs> of this year. At least that's the schedule. Always the FDA, and there's always bargaining what you're going to put in your packaging, certain how you're going to label it, etc. So as I say, it's been available in Europe for a long time. It's under development here, and like the gel. The values of these analytes, testosterone which you're giving, and its androgen product and its estrogen product, are in the main for those 90 days within the physiologic range. I believe this drug is going to turn out to be, once puberty is fully uh, uh, engaged, that is, you've taken the kids through puberty either uh, by himself, and more likely with some supplemental therapy, I believe this is the one that will, uh, five years down the road, be the most used injectable. Uh, do I have a crystal ball that says I'm absolutely certain of that? No. And when you give it to hundreds of thousands of people, they grow a sixth finger, and that's not a good side effect to have. Uh, just something uh, that is uh, completely unknown. It's not like it's never been tried before. There are hundreds of thousands of people in Europe. I believe this is a good drug. Uh, this is something else that's going to last for a long period of time. It is not uh, on the market. Uh, it is uh, probably going to lose out uh, based on the fact that uh, Nabito is coming on. So I don't want to talk about that. Microspheres, the, there are a number of drugs that are developed that are attached to microspheres and then slowly absorbed. Uh, this is in preparation. This is not worthwhile uh, talking about. And then pellets are, uh, pellets started all of the steroids, whether they're related to hydrocortisone, prednisone like drugs, or testosterone, 40 and 50 years ago, all were um, pellets. With little kids that we had with realized adrenal hyperplasia, they needed a salt retaining drug we used to stick it in, uh, on their back for, the, for six to 18 months. Uh, uh, and so, very good drug or very good mechanism. In Australia, probably 50% of men are receiving this. And here, well, well under 1%. So there will be something, they are highly reproducible and dose dependent. Usually about six uh, uh, pellets are put in the arm, minor, very minor surgical procedure. And uh, uh, in, in Australia, it's considered uh, the standard of care. I think uh, once you get over the fear of a minor surgical procedure to get it done, uh, wear a Band-Aid for two or three days, and then not worry about it for another six to nine months, you can measure levels, and when we say six-month intervals, they may last for eight or nine months. And so I think 
if we get past the barrier of who's going to put it in, how you're going to do it, I think that uh, this is another possibility uh, for the longer term. Um, just this is not any different than the drugs for osteoporosis. They were first once a day, then once a week, once a month, once every three months, and then uh, Reclast is the one that is once a year. So these kinds of things are probably going to wind up being important, and it's just it, it's really a, a, a psychological, social barrier to get over because in other parts of the world this is considered perfectly uh, <coughs> legitimate thing to go ahead and do. So uh, subdermal micro uh, capsules, uh, we have a drug, let me get your question in just a sec, we have a drug for precocious puberty that we implant once a year, and so maybe something like this in a silastic tube about that long uh, implant. And some of you may remember, there was a contraceptive called Norplant for a while that was uh, put in the uh, arm. Didn't turn out to be really uh, uh, easy to work with, but these other things may very well be. Yes, ma'am. When is that going to be here? The pellets or the pellets? Uh, pellets are available now. They are? Testapel is the name of them. Yeah, it's just extraordinarily unusual psychosocially to be used as opposed to uh, 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 being available. So they are, uh, what I would it's a, obviously we all use it, it's a new verb. Google Testopel. And that'll, that'll get you to where you need to be. Uh, okay, now. We're going to give this stuff. How the hell are we going to know we give enough? Or not enough? Or too much? So what we usually do with adolescent development, we measure testicular size. Because little boys have small testes, big boys have big testes. Not kids with fine filters. So this is out. This doesn't help us any. So growth velocity, remember I showed you those curves? They should bump up because as you increase growth hormone, it's, sorry, as you increase testosterone, Testosterone is converted to estrogen, believe it or not, and it's the estrogen that makes the pituitary make more growth hormone. That's why you get the spurt. You get the spurt, and you, you don't keep growing because the ends of your bones close because of the testosterone, but again, that's estrogen that makes your bones uh, close. And you can measure the serum testosterone level. Again, if you're using the gel or the patch <coughs> or the veto, you can use the levels. But you can't use the levels if you're using the in other injectables because they go up, then they go down. Which level do you measure? You measure it at two days and you get two and a half times normal. You measure it at uh, seven or eight days and you get normal. Or you measure it at 11 and a half or 13 days and you get subnormal. So it's not so helpful with these newer preparations. It probably will be. And my guess with Nibido is because it's so long acting, probably measuring levels at four months, five months, six months, seven months, eight months, once or twice, you can figure out whether the uh, three monthly, uh, I would put it back, three, two months, three months, four months, five months, you can figure out how long an injection will last that individual patient. On average, it's 90 days, but it's not everybody 90 days. And especially for some people, if it would be 120 days, that would save both injections and bucks. This, none of these drugs is cheap. Okay. So we're going to finish. I use slide C. Everybody, some people are away. I won't say everybody's away. That's too much. So this is the second biological key element. We talked about muscle. We talked about uh, sec uh, other secondary sexual factors, the larynx, and things like that. This is what happens when you're a boy or a girl. During childhood, your bone mass, that's just never mind how we measure it, your bone mass is going up. It reaches a peak. And then it's downhill. Now everybody says, well, of course, older women, older men get osteoporosis. Of course it's downhill. Well, it's downhill if you're a girl or a woman after about 22 or 23, and it's downhill if you're a boy after 24 or 25. So what the purpose, and I'll show you on another slide, is to make the peak bone mass as high as you possibly can, think of it as a bone bank. There are deposits and there are withdrawals. And after the peak, no matter what, the withdrawals are more than the deposits. So, as you go down, and we'll see on subsequent <laughs> slides, somewhere horizontally there's a line that goes across that we'll call fracture threshold. You want to be 111 when you hit your fracture threshold, meaning you'll never get uh, fractures, rather than 30 or 40. Hypogonadal men and women, irrespective of anything else, reach the fracture threshold way early. 
That's why you want to be sure you give as much testosterone, again, convert it to estrogen, to make the peak bone mass as high as it can possibly be. And so as your losses over the years are slow enough that you don't hit the fracture threshold till you're way past old. And this is essentially what happens. Notice along the horizontal axis, you've got childhood, adulthood, and the elderly. So you improve bone acquisition. That's what we're doing by giving testosterone. Build bone as you go through your adulthood. So you want to, and I'll go over how you do that. And then you want to reduce bone loss. And much more important, one of the biggest reasons for osteoporotic fractures is not osteoporosis, but it's falling when you have uh, uh, when you have um, relatively weak bones. And teaching, if I had to take or go to any of the uh, nursing homes where they have people over 60, I would train their balance way before I, I get rugs off the floors, throw rugs off the floors and train their balance. I think that would prevent more fractures than any of these phenomenally expensive drugs. So, we need to acquire bone and what do we do? Well, there are three things that I think are important, and uh, because one of them is silly, you will remember it. So it's calcium, that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Vitamin D, that shouldn't be a surprise. The vast majority of our teenagers and kids and adults are vitamin D subsufficient at least. So, great day, don't listen to me, stand up and get your vitamin D levels up. And the third one is jumping off boxes. So you're laughing. Why the hell do you say jumping off boxes? Well, you need an osteogenic stimulus. And jumping off boxes, this has been shown in PE class in, high, in schools, loads your skeleton enough that you have the osteogenic stimulus, bone building stimulus, if you have enough calcium and vitamin D. About three, three and a half times gravity. So all these kids you see jumping rope, that's the perfect exercise. Climbing stairs, jumping rope is just a great exercise. And that is the osteogenic stimulus that you need. So activity as a kid is important. And keeping up, build bone. This is, if you've got enough calcium and vitamin D, this is keeping up activity. Not some people who are uh, running around athletes and everything in high school and then uh, uh, quit doing things. And that's why getting your kids to learn activities that they can do for a lifetime running, walking, bicycling, soccer, things that you can do la uh, later on are really important. Activity is as important as anything else. I did talk a little about this, but remember I'm a pediatrician, so I, I'd rather prevent it than treat it. <coughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Round rules. It is 19 minutes of, I'm gonna quit about three minutes of, this is a free-for-all right now. I will try to answer questions, not personal medical questions. Yes, one, two, three. Go ahead. Sir. Hey, uh, once you put the gel on it, once you put it on the skin, yep. how long does it take to absorb into the... the about, about 20 minutes, you're pretty safe with uh, somewhere around that. Uh, I would cover it and uh, probably not get into activities that involve women or children uh, much before an hour or so. Yes, sir. Yeah, so you, you said that the goal is to restore the, uh, the normal brain of the testosterone. Yes, sir. But could you comment on the difference between the, the, the quality of the normal range and a functional difference for the kid? Well, that's a tough one. Probably the normal range, if you are an endocrine technician, careful of my words, the normal range is it. That's all you want to hit. If you're an endocrine doctor and you want to talk to your patient, see how he feels and what the differences are, then you use the level as a guidepost. Right. The level of normal for the most assays is 300 to 1,000. That's 300 to 1,000 for men. I don't take care of men. I take care of a man. And so that's why you have to temper and that's an incredibly important question. You have to temper numbers. I don't want, I don't want to take care of you because your numbers are 350. Okay? If I'm a physician, I'm going to take care of you as a person. And oh, by the way, that's a guidepost to help me regulate the dose of testosterone. So that to, is an important question. Yes, sir. You need to make sure the, kid, the, the child is feeling good and, and behaving well and is you know, just kind of feeling good. And you 
could not have said it any better. That's why I'm a doctor and not a technician. Ma'am, did you have a question back yeah, there? Yeah, I did. Okay, so you had a comment where you said 47, um, 47 XXYs may go through natural puberty. So when, as a parent, do you go, okay, now we've got to get, because we don't have an endocrinologist right now. The most difficult uh, question of all, and that's when you don't have an endocrinologist, the endocrine technician answers your question. Uh, you got to have somebody who knows. I, I, I'm sorry I can't answer it any better than that, uh, but uh, that's why you have to temper these things by a physician taking care of a child. That's what we do. We take care of children. I don't care about blind colors. So taking care of blind colors is easy. But care of children who have blind colors, that's a little different. Yeah, so you look for a pediatric endocrinologist? In the beginning, absolutely, because remember, the adult endocrinologist, I'm trained as an adult endocrinologist, so uh, I, um, the uh, pediatricians are much more used to the development of puberty. Remember, when you're an adult doctor, you got a disease or you don't got it, you don't think about the developmental aspects. That's why it should be a pediatric endocrinologist and offline, I can uh, help you with whatever part of the country. I happen to be the secretary of all of the pediatric endocrinologists in the country. There are thousands of us. So there are ways, there are ways that we can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Let's go over here. Yes, um, this is personal, but I'm supposed to bring it up because it could affect other people. Go, and I'll tell you, I won't answer it if I, if I won't answer it. Side effects of testosterone? Or? Side effects of testosterone. Yeah, yes. high hematic right now mm -hmm. and high MCV. He was told by his. Endocrinologist, and you might have to go off of it. Well, and, yeah. and I wanted to get your opinion on that particular side effect, and does anybody stay on testosterone even though you're having? Yes. Repeat the question. High hematocrit, high MCV, uh, <coughs> necropuscular. <coughs> and low MCV. Well, yeah, HCV. Yeah, that's in the individual sense. It's okay. It's not a. Uh, and the issue is one of the side effects. It's not really a side effect. It's actually a known effect of testosterone, which is why the bicyclists use it, is to get their hematocrit up. The higher your hematocrit, the more sludgy your blood is, and after a while, it can be very dangerous. Bicyclists have died because they had high hematocrits, got dehydrated, and then their blood sludged. So the answer to that is, should the patient come off testosterone just because their hematocrit is high? My thought would be quite different. My thought would be to stop it probably for a month and then start back at a lower dose. It's very dose dependent. And just to use the knee jerk reflex of stop it because your hematocrit went up doesn't make sense to me. Next question. Yes, yes, then we'll come over to this side. There are two or three on this side. Please. Well, I've always heard the injections can cause heart problems. Uh, not that I'm aware of, except if you have a bad liver and go through that. So injectables are probably as safe as anything we know. Uh, yes. What is your opinion on uh, putting the gel on at night? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The levels of hormone with the gel after the first few days, the levels of the hormone stay the same for about 24 hours. So it really doesn't matter. Yes, uh, let's go uh, over here to three or four of you, then we'll go back and back. Okay. There seems to be some controversy uh, with, with whether or not they should continue to measure the FH, FSH. FSH and LH levels yes. once they've started the therapy. Yes. I don't think it's controversial. Uh, FSH you're never going to bring down. LH bringing it down to the normal range is a secondary goal. If it goes very low, you're probably giving too much. So maybe once a year, once every two years, I'll, I'll measure LH. Talking to the kid or adult, it's mostly kids for me, talking to the kid or adult is probably as important. So yes, it's a marker of the <coughs> Some people on our list have said that they that they've been told that it has nothing to do with it once you start it, but with our son. No, it, it, it isn't. That's the problem of li listening to the list. <laughs> that you. is the major issue. A couple here, one here, and then we'll go. Yes. Um, the age. You did mention the age at which you should start the hormonal. That, that's extraordinarily controversial. I didn't do it on purpose. It's an individual. Thing. Nobody, there are people say 12, 13, that's absolutely wrong. It depends upon what the stage of puberty is of the kid because many of them will go through spontaneous puberty. On one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be happy to talk about individuals, but not here. Uh, 
Yes. At, at what age would you transition from a pediatric endo to an adult endo? It depends. At what, age, what age would you transition from shots to gel? All right. Uh, it, the latter is a little bit more difficult. The issue about what age you transition to an adult endocrinologist depends upon who you are and what you do and where you are. Uh, some people will say 16, I think that's way too young. The end of high school is where many people transition, but I don't take new patients above 18 usually, except for 10 fine I have 35 new patients. I'm a pediatrician. Uh, and uh, so I usually transition kids in either 18 if they're not going to college, but they are going to college at 22 because they usually live at home still. I need to see them once or twice a year, and it seems silly for me to send them to somebody, then you're going to have to send them to somebody else. It's local option. So, Yes? Is there a of questions to understand at the level is working for my son? When we've gone to the endocrinologist, he asked him, mm -hmm. how do you feel this at the beginning, how do you feel at the end? I feel like that's too wide open. Is there something published to... No, there is not. This is, at? this is difficult. This is one of the things that we hope that our uh, psychologists can help us. We as, as physicians don't have very much <coughs> to do except our own experience. And I've been doing this for 35 years. It's a little easier for me. Not that I am aware of. I am not aware of that. Yes, please. What age do you get a baseline for the testosterone level? Usually, what I do is somewhere around. Uh, well, it's not usually testosterone. That doesn't help me very much. It's uh, usually FSH and LH. Probably around ten, because what I usually do is I see the kids. I often see them young. I, I, as, as I told you, I'm semi-retired. I see a lot of kids once. I don't see them again. I just can't give lunch to people care uh, at either of the two institutions that I uh, work at. I do see a lot of new patients once. They understand I'm only going to see them once, and that's okay with them. And usually I see them once around age 10, once around 11 or 12 to talk about testosterone, and then I usually make decisions around age 12. It is the minority that I actually start at age 12, it's usually 13 or 14, because with this condition they've started pretty much, most of them have started pretty much on their own. Yes, please. Is there any reason physically to start testosterone prior to the human? Uh, let Judy answer that. Uh, uh, is there a reason now? No. Listen to her research. There may be. I doubt it, but she's doing the proper study. Yes, please. Have you ever seen a Klein-Felter's patient that you felt did not need testosterone? Yes, and, not, and way more than one. Okay? Because their levels are pretty high, they're pretty androgenized, and they're already having behavior problems. So the answer <laughs> is unequivocally, yes, I have seen them. Uh, yes, please. Uh, her son is, is he from Costa Rica, so I'm yes. not to name him or if I can't the same name. Excuse me, the name is Eric Richmond Padilla, National Children's Hospital. Tell her that. That's who she needs to see. Richmond Padilla, he's the head of endocrinology at San Jose Children's. I trained him. I know him well. Oh, the name? Yes. <laughs> Eric Richmond Padilla. And I don't have to spell the data for you. You know how to spell. Or yeah. Yeah. Hospital, right? yes, the, the big hospital. He's the chief uh, uh, LFA at the. Uh, <laughs> yes. In San Jose. Please. She was asking that uh, her son is already in the middle, but uh, he he's still not getting a good label. He still goes up or down. Do uh, need like more time to? No, I would go see Dr. Richmond Padilla and uh, let him help you. And if Eric doesn't know the answer, he's going to ask me because I still am in contact. Oh, with great. Him. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, please in the back. Uh, the, the testosterone is so darn regulated by the pharmacy that we can only get our new badge on the very last day that they calculate. Do you have any suggestions for getting a, like a little extra supply? Somehow no, that uh, you have to remember, this is not because testosterone, in essence, is so terribly dangerous like narcotics, but it is a scheduled drug. And the answer to that, I believe, is if your physician notes this, says that we have to give it every day instead of three or four days later, that that, that can be done. I use another drug called Lupron for post Why I use it is unimportant. And that's an every 28-day drug, not every 30 days. Some kids need it every 25 days. 
But if there is good reason, if your levels are down or because you're feeling terrible, then I would ask that to be overridden, which we as physicians can do. We all, I mean, you have to have a DEA number, as I do. And so you could write that legitimately. What I don't know is whether the ins it's the insurance company <coughs> or the pharmacy. Uh, that's something I'm not going to solve right here. Uh, six more minutes, yes. The question the long-term side effects, and where are you seeing with the abuse potential with these uh, All right. Number one, the long-term side effects really aren't very many if given in physiologic uh, doses. They're not any different than natural testosterone. Amatocrit is one. Um, I'm not sure what else I would be uh, concerned about. Abuse potential in this population, my experience, close to zero. And narcotics, big, strong narcotics, are essentially not abused by people who've been terribly, post-operatively ill for three weeks, four weeks, enough that somebody who had an addiction potential would easily be addicted. They just, in my experience, they just don't get addicted. That is not a, uh, uh, a well-researched area by me. I don't think it's known. I don't know it. More questions. Yes, ma'am. Um. Talk about um, the transfer effects to women, like what happens yes. when the gel gets on, yes. make sure I smell it. Not smell. Smell is the alcohol. You don't smell the testosterone. Oh, okay. It's got to be an alcohol so it goes through the skin. Okay. The side effects are if you're menstruating, stopping of your menstrual periods, hairiness, um, acne, oily skin, oily hair, those kinds of things. So like if my son washes his hands but he doesn't use soap, which probably happens all the time, and he uses a towel, my daughter uses a towel maybe like a couple hours later. Absolutely not. That is completely forbidden. She should not touch ever the same towel. Okay. No, no equivocation in my voice. Okay. Never. Never. Okay. <laughs> is yes. Uh, yes, please. Did you say that the gel shouldn't be used when uh, kids just started puberty? The gel isn't used, at least by me, in kids starting puberty because the dose is high. It's not like butter where you could cut it, you know, a quarter of a cup, a half a cup, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, uh, it's just too much. I don't usually start until I have them on doses of uh, uh, 150 milligrams a month or 100 every other week. So I don't start with the gel. Yes and yes. You, do you have a preference? You mentioned all different types of the applications of testosterone. Yeah. Do you personally have a preference? Absolutely. Down, shot? Okay. Injectable. Yeah. Injectable. Okay. Because I know how to use it. I've used it for a long time. I know how to meter the dose very well. I can go, for instance, I can go um, 50 milligrams, 50, I don't do it, 55 milligrams, 60 milligrams with the gel. It's just those of you who use it, it's slop. You know, it comes in a, it comes in a uh, like a ketchup little packet or a, a soap packet, and you rub it around. So uh, that's why my preference, very clearly, is the injectable, and it is the injectable only early on. To answer your question, yes, please. I think I heard you say that you had to have alcohol to make the, the testosterone absorb. Yes. Yeah. What about cream based? Uh, that that works, but when you weren't here. Uh, uh, most of the cream based are uh, bioidenticals and uh, or, uh, uh, whatever they call them. And I made a very strong point that I don't believe in them at all because they are not, not only are they not regulated, that doesn't worry me so much too, but the raw materials aren't the same. So if you make it up the same way, uh, three months later you might have a third of what you wanted or three times what you wanted. So that's why I don't believe those. The creams do work. No question. Yes, please. Once they start uh, testosterone therapy, do they reach an age where they stop it, or is it lifelong? Oh, it better be lifelong, and the bones and how you feel. Uh, uh, just ask uh, <laughs> offline some of the men who are in this room when they have to stop for one reason or another, even if it's something silly, not silly, as insurance won't pay for it for two months. Uh, they'll let you know right away that I ain't interested in stopping this stuff. Yes, please. Um, how, how, how many, how many uh, cases do you have that, that the kids have um, that don't need to take testosterone or that are producing enough? How often do you have the cases that kids have? Uh, I sort of answered that before. Probably a fifth of them, maybe uh, maybe a sixth of them. It's a minority, but it's not one out of a thousand. Uh, yeah, did you have a question up here? Guys, we got two more minutes. Go. Um, uh, saliva essays over blood. Yes. Uh, what are you? Are you um, I, 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 
I am so used to blood assays, but now some of the, well, let's, let's, go, let's move backwards. Testosterone assay, assays have been just horrible. The uh, different labs measure different things and they can differ by 100%. The newer assays for blood are done by a fancy separation technique. It's unimportant. It's just a totally different, quant qualitatively different technique. What type of test is that? This is the GCMS, gas chromatography assay. Most of the big labs do it now. So that's good in the blood. And the salivary ones, because in the saliva, you measure about a hundredth of the level that you measure in the blood. So some of these new fancy assays will be able to measure accurately stuff in the saliva. Right now, I don't have enough confidence in salivary assays. Two minutes, yes. The screens have the black box warning, the bio well, Of course they don't, because they're not a drug. But do they have the same uh, problem that if you get it on your worse? because they stick around on the skin even longer. Because they're not, as Robert mentioned, they're not in alcohol, they don't get absorbed so easily. They're in a cream base that opens up the pores to let the stuff in. So uh, they're not a drug. So th th these folks can laugh all the way to the bank because they don't have to comply with anything. That's what's scary about it. That's why I don't use them, and I'm pretty vocal. Obviously, uh, Susan, Sum Suzanne Summers is in the light room. <laughs> <laughs> it's two more questions. One, two, and then we're done. One of the creams is called Testins. Testin is not a cream. It's, it's a gel. 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 Or is it just a pharmaceutical game? It's a pharmaceutical game. They're both good. I, uh, in fairness, I'm a consultant to Solvay, which makes an energy gel. I'm not a consultant to Oxilium, which is why I, uh, I, I am absolutely not in the marketing business here. Disclosure, yes, but not in the marketing business. In my opinion, either one. Yes, it is. Um, so I struggle with my son trying to put the gel on. Now, if I just let him go one day and just do, you know, whatever, do it if you want, don't do it, will he respond to wanting to do it on his own, do you think? Not one day. Probably a week or a month, you probably will. Do you think that's a good idea? Uh, I, you know your son, your physician knows your son. Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't go any further than that. Guys, we did it. Yes. Yes.